Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Accelerate Apache Spark Workloads on S3. We're glad everyone could join us today. My name is Amelia and I will be your moderator. Before I introduce you to our speakers, I have just a few housekeeping items. All participants are automatically on mute throughout the presentation. If you have any concerns or wish to communicate with me, you may do so by selecting questions from the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. Just type your message or question and I will be able to see it. I will be monitoring this throughout the presentation. We will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation so we can answer all of your questions. Again, to ask a question, select questions from the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. You may ask your question at any time during the presentation, and you don't need to wait till the end. Lastly, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand playback. We will email you the link to the presentation in the following days. Great. So that's all the housekeeping items. Let's meet our speaker. Um, we are very pleased to welcome Dipti Borker, who is the VP of Product and Marketing at Alexio. She has over 15 years experience in data and database technologies across relational and non-relational databases. She also has extensive open source experience. Prior to Alexio, she led product at Kinetica and Couchbase and has also assumed several leadership positions at Couchbase. Without further ado, I'll pass it on to Dipti. <coughs> Thanks, Amelia. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for the Spark uh, on S3 webinar. And um, I'll, I'll be talking about um, how Aluxio helps uh, with this uh, with this new stack that's becoming quite popular. We'll talk about the different options that uh, um, that are available to run Spark on on S3, uh, and then focus uh, on uh, EMR, uh, AWS EMR, as one of those options. Uh, and do a little bit of a deeper dive. Uh, and then we'll talk about a uh, little bit about Aluxio, the architecture of Aluxio, uh, and so on. So let's get uh, get right to it. So um, as I mentioned, um, uh, analytics on the cloud, uh, it's becoming very popular uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the cloud in general provides a lot of elasticity um, and the ability to get compute on demand, obviously, uh, as most of you are probably aware. But specifically for analytics, um, uh, the first thing is that a lot of uh, enterprises and users were focused on the Hadoop stack uh, on-premises up until now. Uh, and HDFS and Hadoop, that ecosystem, uh, was, a, is a li was a little bit difficult to, or is a little bit difficult to run in the cloud. It wasn't built for uh, cloud environments as such. Scalability um, of HDFS uh, is a little bit harder. Uh, and so uh, with AWS uh, making, uh, creating S3 and S3 becoming extremely popular, it's a very simple API to use, and it's very cost effective. Um, users starting, started to think about using S3 for analytics. And while it wasn't built for uh, analytical use cases, because of this simple API, it uh, you know, gets inputs essentially uh, with a few metadata operations, uh, it simplifies uh, workloads dramatically. And so we're seeing a lot of usage uh, of this, uh, of this uh, stack with Spark and S3. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can uh, run Spark on S3. There's a few different options, and there's, there's probably more than this. I've, I've, I've kind of focused on three here. Uh, if you have additional comments, uh, do feel free to ask questions along the way. Uh, we're happy to make this a discussion. So the first one is just doing a native Apache Spark install on uh, uh, AWS EC2. So what that means is you essentially bring together um, EC2 instances, uh, you do a native install of Spark uh, on those nodes and create this cluster, uh, and um, and there's many manual steps involved, right? So there's a, there's a lot of installation, there's prerequisites that need to be installed, um, uh, Java and so on, and so it becomes it's quite a tedious process to do to do this by yourself. The second option is using bundle services. Uh, on any of the clouds for AWS, it's EMR, uh, which actually stands for Elastic MapReduce. But the stack itself is a combination of many different uh, uh, projects and many different uh, technologies, and we'll take a look at what that stack is in just a minute. And what it enables you to do is very easily create a cluster with a full stack that can be uh, uh, scaled up or down as needed on demand. Uh, and they're adding more capabilities along the way. They just added um, uh, HA capabilities, for example, uh, 
uh, and so on. So it becomes easy as a user to go in, start up a cluster, uh, and uh, and then scale it. And they do have capabilities to insert other services like Aluxio into that stack. And we'll take a look at what this looks like, how it can be done for Aluxio um, towards the end of the presentation. And the third option is a managed service. And a managed service uh, is, is kind of a fully managed a vertical stack um, that's, uh, that runs in the cloud, uh, but it provides a, a service. And an example of that is uh, Databricks for, for Spark. Uh, but some of the, while while it's very integrated, uh, you you may have other frameworks that you also want to use beyond Spark, and so for that reason, uh, EMR and some of the other uh, services provide a good alternative because not only do they come bundled with Spark, but they also have Presto, Hive, and other workloads uh, built in. So for the presentation today, we'll focus uh, on AWS uh, EMR uh, and uh, take a look at how Aluxio fits in. So let's let's keep going. Um, in EMR in general, and uh, all these um, frame uh, services are built on top of S3, and S3 is um, a phenomenal storage system, highly distributed, globally available, simple API. Uh, but it wasn't really built for analytics. It wasn't. It was built for um, uh, core data, if you will, uh, backup uh, for of data. Uh, like object stores emerged, and uh, and so to make it ready and make it um, 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 better for analytics, particularly interactive analytics, if it's Spark SQL or Presto, uh, there are a few things that would need to be improved. Uh, one is that the metadata operations like list or rename are um, expensive, and so um, EMR, the EMR service itself provides uh, an option. We'll take a look at that, and we'll also take a look at how Aluxio helps. Uh, the next one is eventual consistency, and so it is uh, for write, read on writes. Uh, sometimes it can be eventually consistent, and depending on the kind of workload, you might be willing to uh, work with eventual consistency, or you might need strong consistency. So it's something for you to think about. And then the third one is uh, performance uh, inconsistencies, and this is this is more uh, uh, around SLAs, so query SLAs. If you have demanding query SLAs, what we've seen in our own runs as engineering runs internally is that two runs back to back even may not have the same results and they vary quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and even more so if it's uh, uh, in, across regions, in different regions and so on. And so if performance is a consideration for you, you might uh, want to think about what the options are and alternatives are. So that's where um, AWS EMR comes in. Um, EMR is a um, uh, is a very easy to use service um, uh, by its by it itself. It comes with many different uh, components, and this is kind of a simplified architecture, if you will, of EMR, uh, the service itself. Uh, not only does it come with Spark, but it also comes built in with uh, um, with other services like Hive and Presto. Uh, and within uh, EMR, uh, uh, you have two options for data access, if you will. You it does come bundled with HDFS, and so you could use HDFS as uh, an option to store your local data, or you could use uh, EMRFS. Which is not uh, it, it's not a data tier. It is more a metadata tier, uh, which allows uh, which helps with some of the uh, the metadata issues that S3 has. And so you could access data through EMRFS, and it gives um, uh, it comes with certain um, advantages. So this is essentially the stack, and you can select as a user how many nodes you want. Uh, and it's very easy. You can just say five nodes, ten nodes, a hundred nodes, a thousand nodes. We've seen users running a thousand nodes on EMR. And uh, and you can just scale it out uh, quite well. Now let's take a look at HDFS specifically with uh, EMR. So for some some workloads you might use um, HDFS, and the reason for this is if you have a uh, workload that's already configured for HDFS that you've just moved over, uh, then you might want to use HDFS. However, the issues are that you would have to manually copy or do a disk CP between S3 and HDFS. Uh, and this would, uh, while it's you know it, the copy part is easy, uh, it's not easy to synchronize the two data sets because when, as soon as you create a copy, you're creating another data set, and if you are running any updates on it or changes on it, it's very hard to sync this data back. 
and that's one of the challenges that we see as HD uh, with users um, who use HDFS to store data and try to sync back uh, to S3. In addition, uh, it is uh, as soon as you create a, a copy, that copy is stale because if there are underlying changes on S3, uh, the, the H data in HDFS is not refreshed, and so you might not be working with the most recent data. Um, let's move on to uh, EMRFS and uh, and what it allows uh, users to do. So EMRFS is essentially a layer that sits on top of S3 to provide um, um, better metadata uh, consistency as well as performance. And it's built, it's actually built on uh, DynamoDB, um, AWS DynamoDB, and metadata is actually cached uh, in EMRFS. Um, this allows for strong consistency uh, as well as the ability to um, uh, have better performance on some of the metadata operations. However, um, it, uh, it needs its own um, uh, management, if you will. So you have to go in and purge some of this uh, on a, a frequent basis. Um, not all metadata is uh, is included in an EMRFS. So for example, when you write data, uh, the metadata for that file or object may not be uh, added to EMRFS. Uh, and also it does not include data caching. So if you want data locality for your Spark workloads, that's something uh, that you might want uh, as a part of your stack within every node. So you get node level uh, data locality. So that's that's where Aluxio comes in. So Aluxio can help accelerate uh, Spark workloads on S3 in, in a couple of different ways. So first thing is it provides a data caching layer uh, for Spark, and that means that uh, it this data is uh, is not only made locally available to Spark on every node, but it also can sync data back and forth uh, from S3 so that that's not stale. And there's a couple of different approaches to do that. Uh, because it stores um, metadata as well as data, uh, you do still, like EMRFS, you get the strong consistency for metadata operations uh, and better performance. As well as for writes, uh, uh, we have asynchronous writes uh, that go through Aluxio uh, that would be faster than directly writing uh, through uh, 2S3 because the writes would be uh, slower. Fundamentally, Aluxio is a, a, a memory based, and so you would work at the speed of memory as opposed to the speed of um, uh, the underlying storage system or network. Uh, you can also have it um, uh, configured for S SSDs, for example, and we'll take a look at that in just a bit. Um, it also provides API compatibility uh, across uh, different APIs, so HDFS API, S3 API, and so a lot of the uh, manual uh, movement or changes to the applications are avoided because of this compatibility. So in terms of EMR, this is what it would look like if uh, Aluxio is kind of put into this picture. In every node of uh, EMR, uh, you can have Aluxio built in, uh, that can be a metadata as well as a data cache um, to for not just Spark workloads, but for all these workloads, so Spark, Presto, and Hive. And Aluxio syncs back and forth with S3. Um, there is a, a polling mechanism that allows Aluxio to look up metadata operations or look up changes um, to a specific file um, or object um, uh, on a regular basis. And so this is a configurable interval that you can set so that you can pull data from S3 um, into Aluxio. So specifically for Spark, how does that help? Um, the first one is it helps between uh, uh, sharing of data across workloads and across jobs. Uh, and this is important because if you have long running jobs, sometimes uh, Spark jobs or ETL jobs that might be long running where you have uh, one phase that's creating intermediate results and you want these intermediate results to get fed in to the next phase, uh, which is um, uh, which is starting off something else. It could be um, uh, feature um, extraction, it could be um, data transformation, um, it could be a variety of things. Uh, but if there's sharing of data involved, then you might want um, the ability to um, have data accessible across these jobs in a very easy way. The second one is resilience between application crashes, and um, uh, and this is this is you know uh, we we hear this sometimes where 
uh, if in a perfect world, if you write perfect code and you don't have any bugs, then crashes won't happen. But a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, and that's where you want resiliency because especially for long running jobs, you don't want to start from scratch. If you have phases built into your workload, you could start off with phase two instead of starting off phase one. And we'll take a look at how, how Aluxio helps with that. And then finally, it's uh, con to consolidate memory usage and alleviate uh, GC issues. So one of the things that um, that we see is uh, memory is a limited commodity in some ways. Uh, for on every node, uh, you have to you have many things that are going on that need memory, uh, and um, within the Java heap itself, you there's there's limited size that you can allocate uh, beyond a certain size. Um, you start to see um, a serious performance issues with the garbage collection. Uh, and because of this, having a layer that's off heap, that's off the Java heap and uh, separated um, helps because not only do you still get uh, um, memory speeds, but at the same time, uh, you get uh, better memory usage from a, uh, from a per node perspective. So let's take a look at the first one, which is data sharing between jobs. So here you just have Spark um, running on S3, and let's say you have block one and three uh, that are that are being accessed here by the by the first one, and then these then get read in uh, again for the for the second job. So if you are running with a Luxio in the middle, then the the data that's created by Spark uh, can sit within a Luxio. And then that can be used by the by the job, the next job that kicks off, without having to write to S3 or asynchronously writing to S3, uh, and so your your access becomes um, uh, at memory speed as opposed to speed of S3. And this is particularly useful for longer running jobs where there is a lot of data getting created, and uh, you could asynchronously write uh, down to S3. Uh, as well as access this in, these intermediate results um, by the next job uh, uh, within Aluxio itself at memory speed. The second use case we looked at specific to Spark was uh, uh, for data resilience and uh, what does this actually mean? So in the case of uh, having a Spark just directly running on S3, you uh, let's say you have you're working off a couple of blocks. Um, you have block one and block three that are being used. They get converted to maybe RDDs or data frames within the the Spark job itself, uh, and then you have a crash within the Spark uh, uh, job itself. The in-memory storage will also be lost because it's a part of the same process. Uh, and so to start off the job again, you would have to start again reading block one, block three, uh, and so on. And so the uh, it, you you don't have a resiliency between um, between jobs that are running. With Aluxio, what happens is uh, these blocks are stored within Aluxio itself. And because it's separated, it's not a part of the same process. It's a it's a separate process. Um, it will still be available, and that data block one and block three will be available, and block four, which was generated by the pre the the job, will also be available and can be read in directly, and then that job can continue. So if there is a crash, uh, what happens is the the data stays in memory and it is available to you when you bring the workers the Spark workers back up, and so it helps with. Um, uh, uh, particularly helps with long running jobs uh, and helps with data resiliency. So you don't need to reread uh, that data back into the process. So hopefully this gives you um, ideas in terms of how Aluxio can help with your Spark workloads. There's a couple of scenarios we talked about uh, as well as how it fits into EMRFS. Uh, now let's take a little bit of a look at what Aluxio is as a, as a technology and an open source project um, and where it came from. So Aluxio originated at the AMP Lab at Berkeley, um, and uh, our founder and CTO, Hao Yuan, uh, was a PhD student back then and was working on Project Tachyon, as it was called initially. Uh, and, uh, and he was focused on uh, creating a new layer between compute and storage that fundamentally separated these two to be able to scale compute elastically as well as storage elastically. 
Now, Project Tachyon uh, uh, ch changed and <laughs> became Aluxio over time. Uh, we're an Andreessen-funded um, uh, company, and, uh, and it is open source and an Apache 2.0 licensed product. Um, and, uh, uh, and today, it is ex it's even more relevant in the context of the cloud. Because as uh, computes have emerged and as cloud technologies have emerged and, and cloud environments are becoming more prevalent, data is now spread across even more so. It could be on uh, premises, it could be in S3, it might be in another cloud, it might be in an on-premises on object store. Uh, and uh, Aluxio helps consolidate this uh, into um, and make it more accessible for the compute frameworks. So, you know, if you go back to the data ecosystem 10, 15 years ago, the world was quite simple. We had MapReduce and HDFS all nicely located in a single box that could scale out horizontally, uh, but the world looks quite different today. So while this webinar is focused on Spark, um, there really are a range of different frameworks that you are probably looking at. And um, if, if for each framework, you had to build, um, uh, you know, a, a optimization bit for the storage systems where your data is stored un underneath. It gets quite complex, and that's where Aluxio comes in. So Aluxio is a data orchestration layer that sits between compute and storage, and um, and provides many different APIs for the northbound as well as the southbound side, as we call it. So on the northbound side sits compute. We have, you know, it could work with Presto, Spark um, on the uh, on the the structured data side of things, um, or even TensorFlow and Cafe on the machine learning, deep learning side of things, um, because we provide a range of APIs. So HDFS is, um, um, you know, still predominantly used by Spark as well as Presto. Uh, S3 is becoming more popular. Uh, and we also have a POSIX interface that is uh, 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 now coming up more and more for Python-based uh, AI frameworks. And so while the data that sits within the data tier uh, is the same, it could be an ORC file or a Parquet file, the way of accessing the same information is different for each framework. And that's what makes, uh, um, makes uh, it, it helpful to have all these different APIs on top of that data, uh, and that uh, as well as translation of APIs. So if you have an HDFS interface on the top that Spark is using, you could switch that over to S3 driver on the bottom and use um, S3 uh, where you might have migrated your data to, right? And so that 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 helps in um, uh, in bringing your workloads uh, together and and moving them to the cloud. Now in terms of um, uh, in terms of the key innovations, Aluxio brings data locality, and we looked at uh, that uh, earlier with the data resilience as well as uh, with EMRFS. Um, it, it, there is a multi-tiered cache that's built into Aluxio, uh, brings data accessibility, and as we saw, there's many different APIs uh, and data connectors and drivers that Aluxio brings, uh, both on the compute side as well as the storage side. Uh, and then it provides elasticity, and elasticity is brought together by having a global unified namespace, which allows you to make many different systems, many different storage systems accessible to Aluxio, and through Aluxio, there is one namespace that gets exposed to the, uh, to the compute frameworks um, on the top. So let's take a look at what these three mean and in a little bit more detail. So the first one is data locality. And within Aluxio, so you have a, a Aluxio, let's say this is an, a single worker of Aluxio. Within that, you can actually configure it to use RAM, and we use uh, 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 RAM disk, uh, SSDs, and, and HDDs. Uh, and there are um, algorithms, LRU, Greedy, um, LRFU, you can pick the algorithm to manage your hot, warm, and cold data within Aluxio itself. Um, depending on uh, your workloads and the importance of data. And underneath, uh, underneath Aluxio obviously sit the various storage systems that you have access to. In addition, um, Aluxio provides age, uh, API translation. And so if you have existing applications that were written for the HDFS interface, there is uh, no need to switch them over uh, and rewrite them using an S3 interface because that's a quite a non-trivial exercise, actually, uh, to, to migrate um, 
um, the application itself to use a completely different API. So instead, um, Alexio allows for API translation, and it will tr it will translate from HDFS to S3 um, for data that's stored in in S3, or it could be an on on premises object storage, uh, or it could be um, uh, HDFS even in the back. And the third one is Elasticity using a global unified namespace. So Aluxio itself um, allows for many different uh, systems, storage systems, to be mounted in, and so it has accessibility to the data stored in those systems. As an example here, we have, let's say we have HDFS. Uh, it's mounted as a, a root under for Aluxio, and the entire tree essentially gets, uh, gets made accessible to Aluxio. So you see here, you have users, uh, you have uh, uh, um, you know Alice and Bob underneath it, uh, and it's 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 accessible to root. In addition, you let's say you have S3 uh, as well. You can mount that bucket, that S3 bucket, under a Luxio root, and that also becomes accessible. So from a from an application perspective, there is absolutely no uh, knowledge to the application uh, as to where this data exactly lives. From uh, from an application perspective, this one single tree, one single namespace, and Aluxio deals with um, moving the data across these storage systems, uh, pulling it from the under storage, making it available, uh, or writing data back uh, to the storage system. And and so this simplifies and completely abstracts compute from storage, making it very easy to scale out your data driven applications uh, whether it's uh, they are whether they're natively installed on EC2 or whether they are being run in kubernetes uh, it is it becomes very easy to scale up and down here's another view of the same approach where you have uh, uh, you have hdfs two different hdfs systems perhaps one object store maybe nfs with legacy data uh, and it gives you you know a mac finder window kind of uh, uh, is a nice way to visualize things. This is what it would look like within Aluxio as a as a tree, um, as a uh, and and with each of these files, uh, each of these objects having their own inode within the Aluxio tree itself. So let's take a look at some of the other um, uh, use cases with Spark um, and Aluxio uh, and in combination with S3. So the um, so the second one we've looked at uh, uh, you know an all AWS use case where you're running Spark um, uh, on S3 directly, but if you have data outside of uh, of AWS, let's say in HDFS, um, and you want to combine that data in some ways and have certain jobs run on data that's uh, stored across both these systems, you might need a hybrid approach. Uh, and with Aluxio, what it allows you to do is you might have S3 mounted into Aluxio as well, and that data will be made available to Aluxio. But in addition, you can pull in data from a remote HDFS or even a remote S3 that's in another region uh, to make it available to your Spark uh, workloads. Um, obviously, working across the WAN is, is too slow, uh, and so if it is a read-heavy workload, once you've copied that data in, once the workload of the working set for that job is in Aluxio. Uh, the data is uh, is all co-located uh, based on um, based on the what the Spark split is asking for. And so, if you have a hundred node cluster, you have a hundred node Aluxio cluster as well that's co-located on every node, and you have that data available within the worker itself. The, another example is running multiple frameworks, uh, and you might want to run uh, Presto or Spark or Hive or TensorFlow, maybe uh, on S3, data on S3, or a combination of systems. Uh, and that also is something that Aluxio enables by having um, drivers for each of these popular um, frameworks and providing a caching layer for these frameworks in addition to orchestrating the data itself. And eventually, um, as use cases and as workloads uh, move to a more multi-cloud environment where there might be need to access data from S3, from GCS, or, or Azure blob storage, um, there could, uh, Aluxio allows consolidation or aggregation of this data on demand, depending on what the working set uh, needs, uh, and making it accessible to many different frameworks on the top. 
So let's take a quick look at the um, at the reference architecture itself uh, and um, get a little bit better idea of how Aluxio works under the hood. So under the hood, um, let's say you have a Spark cluster, uh, as you see here, the second the second cluster here. Um, you have uh, the Spark workers, uh, and you also have the Aluxio client, which is essentially a jar file that becomes a part of the application. And then you have the Aluxio worker itself that's managing the, the data. And these are the blocks of the files that are being accessed and requested by the Spark workload. Uh, as we talked about earlier, it can be used for, it, it can be configured with uh, memory or SSD or disk or a combination of them or all three of them uh, and to create a, a, tiered, um, a tiered data buffer uh, within each worker. The master itself is responsible for managing the metadata. Uh, and the metadata, uh, this is metadata for not only the files and, and uh, objects that Aluxio is managing, it's also metadata about the Aluxio cluster itself, which block is sitting in which worker. And so as clients get requests, um, they get sent to the master. The master figures out which worker has that data. Most likely it will be in the local worker. Uh, and you would do a short circuit read as we call it or a direct uh, uh, this, a read on the same node itself and the data will be returned back uh, to the application. Uh, the there is um, uh, there are HA um, aspects for both metadata as well as data. We have either the Zookeeper or a RAF protocol for uh, the standby masters, um, which allow the standbys to be current and highly available. Uh, and then for the workers themselves, the data blocks, those can be highly replicated as well. Uh, and given that Aluxio is a layer that's meant to enable compute, uh, it leaves the persistence concerns to the, the layer underneath, which is the object store or HDFS. Um, it, it allows for replication as needed uh, based on what the compute needs. So for example, if there is a join table that is extremely um, uh, uh, heavily used and it needs to be accessible on every node of Aluxio, you could replicate that 100 times and have it available versus some other files uh, that might be less less important, and uh, uh, the uh, the 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 range for that become it might be set to very small. Maybe you have only one copy, as opposed to HDFS, where you you have to have three copies uh, of every file. And so this allows for better data management and and data accessibility based on what the workload is actually demanding. And so replication is adaptive. So you have a min and a max on a per file basis. Uh, and so you can uh, you can configure that based on uh, on what your working workload and and your data requires. Um, for reads that are local uh, to the uh, to the worker, they can if they are they would be very fast. We also enable reads from uh, uh, the, the if the data is located in another node within Aluxio, that would get pulled in. Uh, and then send back to the application because it's still faster than getting uh, data over the WAN, for example. Uh, and then if the, the data doesn't reside in Aluxio, it will be get, get pulled in either from the object store or HDFS or whichever system that data is actually residing in. Writes to Alu through Aluxio are, um, uh, have many options as well. You can do a synchronous write uh, for very important data. You can do an asynchronous write. Um, you can do fast durable writes within the cluster and then an asynchronous write back to the understored system as we call it uh, so that you have uh, many different options that you can match based on your performance and your performance SLAs. So hopefully this gives you a good um, our, uh, idea of a Luxio as well as um, uh, the, the architecture, the options to read as well as write data to S3 and many other storage systems. Now for the last few minutes, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, show you uh, how you could bootstrap a Luxio uh, within uh, the AWS EMR uh, service itself. So let me just jump to uh, EMR itself. So EMR is the, uh, the AWS service. It's very easy to run. So here you see I have a few different clusters. Some I've used in the past. I have one running already. Uh, but I'll, I'll walk you through uh, the steps so that you can see how this cluster was brought up. Um, because it takes a few minutes, um, uh, maybe 10, 10, 12 minutes for all the instances uh, to come up. So I'll walk you through the steps, how this cluster can be brought up itself. 
uh, and then we'll take a quick look at uh, uh, you know just log into the cluster and run a, a few simple operations so if you um, to create a cluster um, you could either uh, run it using you know do it on the console or or command line and uh, aws uh, the em uh, the emr cli it, it, the aws command line essentially will allow you to run emr create cluster command and this command itself can include a bootstrap um, option or a, or a or a bootstrap action that um, that allows you to install an, uh, other services that may not already come in with um, uh, the EMR nodes. So, for example, um, you can decide if uh, if which which compute frameworks you want in, on each node. You can say you want Presto or Hive or Spark or all three of them. Uh, in this case, um, you could have um, uh, you could also have the Bootstrap actions as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so let's just keep, let's just go through these um, uh, go through this command one by one, uh, and then uh, look at what the uh, what the actual parameters have been set to on the next slide. So the release label is basically what release of EMR you want to use. Instance count is um, the size of the cluster. Um, instance type is um, do you want an M5, uh, four extra large? Do you want uh, an R5 instance? What kind of instance do you actually want this EMR the nodes to have? Each of the nodes to have. Um, and then this is important to the applications. You can decide which applications you want as a part of the cluster. You can have one or or many. Uh, you can have a cluster name so that on the console it's easier to see if you have um, if you have um, uh, different clusters and you're using different clusters for different jobs. Uh, and then the bootstrap action, which is the most relevant part for Aluxio itself. So you essentially set the uh, path to the bootstrap um, script, which is something that you essentially download and you save it to an S3 bucket. Uh, and um, I'll, and I'll uh, show you the path that, that I've used uh, to bring up this cluster. You have the download URL itself. And so this is, uh, let's say you're using Aluxio 1.8.1 or Aluxio 2.0. It would be the, the path for the, uh, for the, the, uh, the tarball itself. Uh, and then the root path, uh, the URI, as well as some additional properties. And then you have uh, the configuration options, which are stored in a JSON file, as well as your key pair, which uh, for obvious reasons I'm not showing here on the screen. Uh, so here is uh, here are the variables, right? So we looked at uh, the release labels and et cetera. On the previous slide, I'm using uh, 5.2.23.0. I've set it uh, using uh, said number of instances five. That means it creates a five node cluster. You have one master and four workers. Um, you have, um, uh, I'm using the M4 extra large instances. I didn't wanna spend too much money on this, uh, giving it a cluster name. Uh, the bootstrap script uh, is located here. So I have essentially created um, a folder within S3, within this, this bucket and this path. And let me just, uh, uh, bring it up really quick so you can see. Um, 3 Hub is essentially a browser for S3. It makes uh, life easy sometimes. So you see here that uh, I have within S3, I have this bucket called uh, uh, the Pialoxio 2019. Within this, I have EMR. Within EMR, I have my EMR um, uh, shell script, which is the bootstrap script, which essentially will, uh, uh, based on based on the uh, the link that you've given for the download URL, it will pull it down, it will configure everything, it will update the class paths uh, and take care of all the Aluxio configurations so that once the cluster is up, you're ready to go. There's no other additional changes or configurations uh, that need to be made. Uh, and then I've set up a, a, a root UFS path and I've said, you know, put everything under this location. Uh, and then let's see uh, what else. Yeah, I've asked uh, the default, the write type, to be asynchronous through, which means that all the writes that go through Aluxio will be asynchronous. They will be asynchronously replicated to S3, uh, asynchronously written to S3, and then the data will also be stored um, within S3 itself. So let's take a, go back and take a look at uh, the cluster. So here I have my cluster um, that, as you can see, you get a master uh, DNS. Um, the SSH actually gives you directly the, the command that you can run, and I'll run this in, uh, in just a minute. And it also gives you um, the, uh, the 
uh, all the details about everything else. So here you see that you have a master uh, that's um, uh, that's also the M4 extra large, and then um, uh, the uh, the workers and let's see there's interest and and you have the bootstrap option. So you see that uh, I had provided this parameter as a location for the bootstrap option. Uh, it gets stored in here. You can see where it's downloaded from, all the other options, including async through. So you can see that this cluster essentially was created using this this configuration. So once that's run, you see that it's up and running already. Um, I can let me see if this is still alive or if I need to bring up another okay let me just bring up another new window and let me go ahead and connect to that uh, EMR cluster so as soon as I SSH into it uh, I'm into the EMR cluster and um, uh, I'm going to use the the spark shell to maybe run a few basic commands uh, and uh, show you how Aluxio is uh, already integrated. So it'll take a couple of minutes here um, to set up uh, the, the JVM and bring it up. In the meanwhile, let me go to my cheat sheet uh, and copy a few commands here. Let me bring up another terminal. connect to EMR as well. So on one hand, I, on the one, um, try to make this a little bit easier to view. Okay, so let's uh, just see what's under the Aluxio file system. So you can see that I'm just going to opt Aluxio bin and running FSLS. And trying to see what else, what is in the, what is stored there. And I have, you know, some default files. I have uh, a file called uh, two G. It's uh, uh, two gigs. Uh, it's a file that's uh, two gigs. Um, I have, uh, you know, test table, Spark, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, what you see is that zero percent here means that while the metadata for these files, let's say the sample file, uh, is available in within Aluxio. And you can see that it was the Hadoop user that had created it, et cetera. It's not actually in Aluxio itself. And so the 0% means that um, it will need to pull it into Aluxio from the base, uh, the underlying system, right? And so let me just go ahead and uh, pull it out. So on the on the Scala shell, let's go ahead and run and so now it's uh, it's pulled in um and then when I actually let's say do do a count um, it will start running the the job it will start to count um this large file it's two gigs and It's still pulling the data in. And once this is done, that data will be pulled into Aluxio. And now for the next run, um, uh, it, it can be faster. So it takes a few minutes. They're getting, it's getting done. While this is going, any, any questions? Now is a good time to ask questions. Um, yes, we do. We okay. have a question. Is it possible to share yeah. the script? Oh, absolutely. So the uh, the Bootstrap script. This is the Bootstrap script itself. Um, this is available um, within uh, on in our uh, Aluxio documentation itself. So uh, let me actually go ahead and uh, show you where it it uh, it lives, and I will um, paste it into the chat. So uh, oh, my <laughs> thing is messed up. All right, so if you go into the Aluxio documentation, community edition on the master, um, on the edge, if you see edge, uh, within under data applications, you will see AWS EMR, which is a new 
um, which is a new uh, application that we have enabled. And you'll see the, all the instructions on how to get going. Um, the first thing that you need to do is begin and download these scripts as well as the JSON file uh, from the GitHub. And uh, what I will do is I will directly give you, uh, post this into the, uh, the chat window so you have it available. So you might need to send it to everyone. I don't know if everyone has access to it. All right. Okay, so let's go back to our shell and see what happened here. Um, all right, so it read, uh, it went and read in that file, um, and uh, you know it, it posted. Um, there, it, it ran the, it ran the count, and you know it ran a certain amount of time. Now let's go back to the um, out, out of the Scala shell and um, go back to uh, the uh, back to the EMR node and run the same command again the ls command and now you see that it is 100% in aluxio so um that's the that's the beauty of aluxio where even when you begin it if it has access to the metadata it's aware of those files but the data doesn't actually get pulled in unless the compute asks for it now you do have options to pin data and prefetch data if you know exactly what you're going to access for certain jobs uh, and there's a distributed load capability that we have added into our uh, uh, upcoming uh, 2.0 release, uh, which allows you to do a very fast load across all the workers, um, uh, and it will be very efficient, especially as the, the size of the cluster increases. And so that's the way it, it, it fundamentally works. Now, just for fun, let's try and see if we can run this again, uh, and, and let's see if it's, uh, I think one or two of my workers uh, may actually, um, may not be up but uh let's let's see what happens here so it's, it's running uh the count on the same file uh and um uh trying to come back with answers any other questions amelia we do okay i would like to know if aluxio is able to create a data grid for kubernetes yeah, that's a great question. So in this session, we actually did not talk about um, containers and, and Kubernetes. And so um, Aluxio fundamentally is also available uh, via Docker. So we have a Docker container. And so you can create um, a cluster of uh, Aluxio um, within a Kubernetes cluster. And, and it's interesting, you, you'll find it interesting that we call it data orchestration. And there's a reason for that. Um, just like Kubernetes orchestrates compute and containers. Uh, in some ways, Aluxio is orchestrating data and the working sets, bringing them all together and 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 scaling them out across all, all the workers for compute, right? Uh, and so there's a, it's it's an interesting analogy. Now, um, as uh, one given that you we do have these containers, you can either use a daemon set or a replica set within a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, to run, uh, to create an Aluxio uh, cluster itself and have it co-located within your other nodes that might be running Spark or Presto uh, and so on. Uh, and so that's the, that's the way that you would create um, a, a data layer within Kubernetes uh, that's, that's memory-based and, uh, and you still can maintain a really tight data locality for your uh, Spark and Presto workloads. All right, so I've been talking away here. So you see that uh, you know you, we took uh, 36 seconds, and the next time it's 26 seconds um, to run. And so the the more nodes you have, uh, the more distributed the uh, the processing will be, and the faster the processing will be. And so you see, even with a simple simple experiment like that, um, you see significant performance increase uh, between the two runs. So with that, um, I will uh, uh, stop the presentation part and open it up for uh, more questions. We have another question. Is it, is, is it possible to have data only in Aluxio, or is it mandatory to have data in, in a storage, such as S3 and HDFS? <laughs> Good question. So uh, Aluxio is, is designed in a way that it assumes that there is a layer or storage layer underneath it. And the reason is that if Aluxio is just used as another storage system, 
uh, even if it's uh, maybe it's better designed, more capable handle, of handling a lot more data compared with maybe HDFS, uh, you're still creating the same problem of having storage and compute tightly co-located. Uh, if you, if the, the purpose of Aluxio is to be this abstraction layer um, with storage systems underneath it. And you could have data, you could have long running uh, clusters of Aluxio that essentially bring data together from many different systems and make it available to the compute. So in one way, it is storing data, but, but with the purpose of making it more accessible to compute as opposed to being the storage layer itself. Um, uh, storage systems have different concerns, persistence, durability, they're built to be cost efficient like S3, right? Uh, and so that's why uh, we don't recommend having data uh, only in a Luxio and in a distributed way. Now, there might be some use cases uh, where you do need um, some temp data. So you could use, you know, you could use it as a temp, you know, to store temp files. Uh, and that might be an option where you just store it within Aluxio on a per node basis, um, but and you don't care about replication across the data sets and uh, across the workers and so on. Uh, and so that is one use case where you might have a cluster of Aluxio and each worker is basically just storing local data as a local temp cache. Um, uh, uh, for example, for Spark Shuffle uh, type of workloads. Uh, but uh, but that that would be probably the you know most basic. Uh, uh, use case, it doesn't provide the full value of Aluxio uh, in terms of everything else it brings. We have another question. Which kind of EC2 instance is more recommended for use with Aluxio with applications like Presto or Spark? Also in your benchmark, makes a lot of difference to have EBS <coughs> with IOPS. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, Presto and Spark are CPU bound, uh, and so they recommend uh, CPU uh, intensive um, uh, instances. Um, uh, on the other hand, they also need memory. And so uh, what we've seen is the R4, R5 instances are what uh, most uh, users end up using for their uh, Spark and Presto workloads. And the memory itself will get distributed or split across um, uh, between Presto and Aluxio. So um, you could, you know, you you almost need maybe 60, 70 percent um, uh, to maybe 60 percent to Presto, um, 25, 30 percent to Aluxio and the rest to OS. And, um, uh, and if you have attached SSDs, then you could use just the SSD tier for uh, Aluxio. Uh, if you use EBS, uh, while the performance uh, will drop um, uh, um, compared with running it in memory and SSDs, and that's just a fun function of um, the IOPS that each of these layers are providing. Great, I think um, we are out of questions. Uh, there were some; these were some really good questions, and uh, uh, thank you so much for your um, uh, for your time today, as well as your interest. And we hope that uh, you will give uh, Aluxio a try. Yes, I want to thank Dipsy for today's wonderful presentation, and thank you all for joining us. As a reminder, we will be emailing a link to you guys with a recorded webinar. And this concludes today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.